Here's what's unique about the Helio Spring flight controller. It includes both an F3 and an F4 processor working in parallel. And that's important because if you look at what F4 processors and F7 processors, that's kind of the state of the art that we're on right now, at least in the beta flight world. If you look at those processors, neither of them can really max out the capabilities of the gyro chips that we're using. So we've recently unlocked the ability to use these gyros at the full 32 kilohertz sampling rate. And when I say we have unlocked them, I mean us poor beta flight plebs. The race flight's been doing it for a while, it must be acknowledged. But here's the thing. Betaflight can sample the gyro at 32 kilohertz, but it cannot run the PID loop at 32 kilohertz. And now is the point where I won't go into a 10 minute long bunny trail on what the difference between those things is. Let's just say this. For those who want to take advantage of all this fancy new filtering, they argue that sampling at 32K and running the PID loop at 32K gives you the best results. It must be acknowledged that there's people out there who say that that's a bunch of hooey. Like, for example, if we look at the KISS flight controller, KISS V2 runs, does amazing things, and it only runs at 1 kilohertz PID loop. Well, the problem is that F4 and F7 cannot, they don't have enough CPU cycles to run at 3232. They, they just, the CPU utilization goes through the roof. And that's true for the F4. I think it's possible if you overclock the F4 to the maximum, it could do it. But that doesn't, that's not good for reliability, especially if the chip gets really hot, it can lock up. And that is where the Helio Spring comes in. What the developers of the Helio Spring have done is they took the filtering and they moved it over to a separate coprocessor. That's the F3. And then they have all the other stuff that the chip does, and they put it on the F4. So essentially, by splitting the load between these two processors, you can run them, so you can get more done in the same amount of time. And the bottom line is that the Helio Spring is, I think it's the only uh, beta flight or butterfly uh, flight controller right now that can run at 32K and 32K without just cranking the, the CPU utilization through the roof to the point where it's not flyable. And that's pretty exciting. Now I'm going to do a review of this flight controller. That's what we're talking about. But I'm going to save you the trouble of watching the whole review, which is terrible YouTube etiquette but it's good, I'm thinking about your time here. If you are interested in Butterflight, if you are excited by the crazy wacky ideas that Kalen Dorr and the other devs, the Butterflight devs, calm and filters and whatnot, then you just need to get this flight controller and put it in your quad because they're all about pushing the boundaries, right? Do you think that they're going to be like designing to take full advantage of what the Helio Spring can do? Or do you think they're going to be like designing to hold things back so that you can run their magical code on any flight controller? Obviously, they're going to be designing for the Helio Spring. Now, that doesn't mean I fully expect that Butterflight will continue to work on any Betaflight flight, flight controller, F4, F7, maybe not F3 or F1, but I expect that it will continue to work. But I don't expect that it will, you'll be able to take full advantage of the magic unicorn fairy dust that is associated with it. And if that's what you're interested in, Butterflight or uh, uh, Helio Spring is the place to be. So if you're on the fence now, just go ahead. You can watch the rest of the video if you want. But at the end of the day, if you're just a Butterflight fan, if you want to taste that sweet, sweet butter, you're going to build a quad, you're going to put a Helio Spring in it. That's the best way to do it. Okay, now let's take a look at the board. So here is the board layout for the Helio Spring, and I'm going to go over it and review it the same as I review many flight controllers that I don't physically have. I would also normally do a build video for you, but in this case, I, I partnered with my friend Random FPV. He's got his own channel. He's got, he does the Dead Band Show, the a podcast, and he built it for me, and he built it on his channel. So I'll put a link if you want to see him build it out down in the video description. But we don't need to build it out just to take a look at its capabilities. And it is a very cleverly designed board. So 
if we look, uh, first of all, let's just start with how the board is powered. The board can be powered either from battery voltage up to 6S or from 5 volts. And it's often the case, like if you're working with a 4-in-1 ESC, it may be simpler to power the board with 5 volts from the 4-in-1 ESC, whereas if you're working, uh, you know, if, you, if you're not doing that, if you don't have a big 5-volt regulator somewhere, powering it directly from VBAT and using its internal regulator might make sense. So it's nice that they give you the option, and it's a little unusual to see that, frankly. Most flight controllers, you either can power them from VBAT or uh, you could always feed 5 volts into one of the 5 volt pads, but it's kind of an afterthought. In this case, you set that by choosing one of these solder bridges here, one or the other, but not both. Uh, and you and that'll tell the board what you're giving it as as power. But the wiring is the same regardless of whether you're doing 5 volt or VBAT. So that's nice. We can see over here that the board does come set up for camera control. So it's got a camera control resistor on it. That's the feature that lets you control the OSD menu in your camera so you can change brightness, contrast, and other settings without having to pull out that little joystick. You just use your transmitter sticks. This is a pretty cool feature. It doesn't work on 100% of cameras. That's not the flight controller's fault. That's just a limitation of the feature. But with a little bit of command line tweaking, it can usually be made to work. And oftentimes it just works right out of the box. So that's pretty cool. Of course, it's got an OSD built in like all good flight controllers today. And now I've insulted KISS. Sorry, KISS. Over here on the right side of the board, we've got one, two, three, four UARTs broken out. And there's actually an additional UART uh, RX4, which is used for ESC telemetry. Uh, so that's five total UARTs available on the board. Uh, and you can use any of them over here on this side for whatever accessories you require. Or there's also inverted pads for use with SBUS and smart port telemetry. So you don't have to do an uninvert hack on your receiver, a very well thought out design. The power pads here are, are very clever. It's very clever what they've done. Instead of giving you individual one, two, three, four, five, like here's your five volt pad for your receiver, here's your five volt pad for your for your video transmitter, they've just given you these great big fat buses that you can just take all the wires that you need to solder and and it doesn't limit you to a specific number it makes a little more efficient use of space on the board the wiring is not quite as clean as if there was individual wires for individual things but it, it i think it's a very good use of space normally what you would see is for every uart you broke out you'd have tx rx 5 volt ground tx rx 5 volt ground and it would add a whole bunch of pads that most of the time you would never be using because most of the time you're not going to have four different things soldered up here so this is a great way of making the best use of space while still giving you exactly what you need there's a plug over here for connecting to a 4-in-1 esc with the motor outputs with either 5 volt or not connected. If you were connecting, if you were powering your board via VBAT, then you would not connect 5 volts because you wouldn't want to get or give 5 volts to the uh, ESC. But if you're powering your board with 5 volts, you would bridge the solder jumper and you could feed 5 volts into the board and power it from the 4 in 1 ESC. Very clever there. It means that you don't have to, like, just, you don't have to disconnect that wire and leave it dangling and make a mess. You just choose whether you want 5 volts or not with this solder bridge. Very thoughtful. The other thing they've done to save uh, space and make your life a little simpler is they've given you this pin, which can either be current sensing or ESC telemetry. And that's nice because I, I, I made a video recently about current sensing and I discussed how you can do analog current sense or ESC telemetry. That's two ways of getting current information from the 4-in-1 ESC into the board. If you wanna know more about the difference between them, I'll put a link to that video down in the video description. The bottom line is that most of us are only ever going to be using one of these, but different ESCs support different ones. So this means that, again, you don't have a wasted pin by putting both a current and an ESC telemetry. You've just got this, uh, this solder jumper that lets you pick which of those two things you're going to be using. And then finally, here comes battery voltage coming in on this pin, which um, is that used for VBAT? I wonder if you're using VBAT sensing... If you're powering the board with 5 volt and you feed VBAT in here, will you get VBAT sensing or will you fry the board? I'm going to hope that's just VBAT sensing and not VBAT power, but I'm not 100% sure about that. Over here on the left side of the board, there's some accessory pads, including the LED strip output and the buzzer output. 
uh, and uh, there's a 5 volt output just for the LEDs. That assumes you power the LEDs off of 5 volts. And then there's an additional auxiliary pad for the current sense input or RX4 for ESC telemetry. You would use that if you were not using a 4-in-1 ESC and you were not using that plug down in the other corner of the board. One thing that's notably missing from the board is a, a VBAT power pad or any way to power like your video transmitter or your camera from battery voltage. Now, obviously, if you have a battery, you have a way to power, <laughs> you have access to VBAT. You can just solder uh, to one of your ESC positive pads or your main battery pad if you want, but it does keep the wiring a little neater to pull the camera and the video transmitter power back to the flight controller. Um, if you're running your video transmitter and your camera off of 5 volts, then it's no problem to power them from over here. But in my experience, that doesn't always produce the best results. If, unless the 5 volt regulator is just rock solid, you're going you're gonna to sometimes have noise issues. I usually power my camera and my video transmitter off of battery voltage. And I find that the ones that I often use, that they have enough internal filtering to give me relatively noise-free results and it avoids any issues with regulators browning out and any nonsense like that. If you were going to power your camera or your video transmitter from 5 volts, you would have no problem with this board. If you're going to power them from battery voltage, as I suggest, then you're going to need to run the wires to somewhere else on your, flight, on your, on your quad and it may not be quite as neat. So there you go. That's your look at the Helio Spring Flight Controller. And, you know, I probably wouldn't have gone out of my way to review it. Like, I mean, okay, there's some clever things in the layout. It's like, you know, but there's lots of other flight controllers that have similar features. But the thing it brings to the table that nobody else does is the ability to do 30 true 32 kilohertz gyro processing with a 32 kilohertz PID loop and whatever crazy madness the butterfly devs come up with with their filtering and their I don't if that stuff intrigues you then this is the flake as I said at the beginning of the video this is the flight controller that you got to have in your quad it's 40 bucks so if you look at F4 processors with or F4 flight controllers with similar features, the cheapest ones you're going to find probably come in around 30, maybe 35 bucks. It doesn't have a built-in PDB. So those, those are probably closer to 30 bucks usually. So you're paying a little bit of a premium for what you're getting, but you're getting a little bit more with it. And that's the bottom line. Product link in the video description. And I think I've gone on long enough. So I'm going to break out the flight video with random FPV. Uh, we're going to do that in a separate video. Look for that a little later on the channel. Thank you guys so much for watching. Let me know, have you, what have your experiences been with Butterflight? I hear some people say, oh my gosh, it made my quad fly so good. And I hear other people say, well, you know, neither here nor there. I very seldom hear somebody say it made it fly at worse. Anyway, uh, tell me what you got down in the comments. Let me know your thoughts. Thanks for watching. Happy flying.